Okay, well, let's get started. My name is Wayne Bittner. I'm the chief of the restoration program at Kirtland Air Force Base. I'm also a member of the Air Force Civil Engineering Center, San Antonio, AFCEC. Um, want to welcome you guys to our July, our summertime CAB meeting. We have a lot of information. We also have a much more comfortable room to have our CAB meeting in this time as opposed to last time. Um, appreciate everyone coming out and reviewing the posters and trying to stay informed with our project. Uh, a lot of hard work went into that effort and we, I think we put the right people at the posters to answer your questions. And I appreciate the turnout. Um, to start things off, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our recently gained commander for the mission support group, um, Colonel Tony Hawk. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, this is an important venue uh, for us to get information out and to hear your questions, and um, we're going to have lots of opportunity to do that. And I think you're going to, um, I think you're going to like what you're hearing. Um, I, at least I hope so, because uh, we've got a lot of uh, expertise and we've had some changes in the way we're doing business. So, but first, a little bit about me. I'm uh, just out of the Pentagon, so I'm extremely, extremely happy to be out of the Pentagon. Uh, I've been there for an extended stay, so um, very happy to be in Albuquerque. Um, no, I'm not real familiar. I am not from New Mexico. I'm from Alabama. So my kind of hot and this kind of hot is a little bit different. So I'm uh, certainly uh, getting used to the, to the area. Um, and uh, when I was selected to come here a few months ago, I started asking about, you know, the Albuquerque area. And everybody I talked to, uh, to a person, just raved about the area. And, and I can see why. So I've been here for a couple of weeks. My family and I uh, see in the area. My family and my son, who's seven, uh, have a, had had a great chance of seeing what's going on in Albuquerque, and, and we've had a great warm welcome from from the community. So we certainly appreciate that, and we look forward to being part of the uh, part of this team and part of the Kirtland and Albuquerque family. So, um, you know, I'm not going to be the the technical expert as I come on as I come on board. That's not my role. My role is to represent the installation. Um, I'm the military uh, representative for the installation. Um, I'm here to to help get resources to our technical team, which you're gonna, you're gonna hear from here really soon. Um, so I'm, I'm learning every day about what's, what's going on here. I learned before I came here, was studying up as best I could on, on what, um, what our challenges were. I had an opportunity to sit down a, a couple weeks before coming here with, um, or a few weeks, with uh, Ms. Kathleen Ferguson and uh, kind of get her insights and really was able to appreciate her level of commitment to this, to this project. And um, I know she came out not too long ago and was able to visit and, uh, and come speak with folks and to the congressional delegation um, and to the, uh, the folks in the community. So, and I know she's, she's committed, she's made some promises, and that's what you're gonna hear today is uh, how we're going to, um, to kind of move this, this effort in um, kind of a, not necessarily a new direction, but a kind of a new sense of urgency. And I think you're gonna see that in the presentations today. So, um, you know, you're gonna, we're changing our approach a little bit. So um, the, and that's a, due to a lot of different things. Mostly there's some organizational changes that have happened in the Air Force, um, but also based on congressional delegation input, input from, uh, from the, uh, the communities, from the agencies, and from you, you know, we're, we're hearing the voices that we need uh, uh, a new, a little bit sense of, a new sense of urgency, and that's what you're gonna see um, as we go forward today. So again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we're going to have time for questions, and um, one of the, also, let me just add, one of the changes you're, you'll see is a couple of new faces to the team. In addition to myself, you're also going to meet Dr. Adria Bodur uh, shortly, and uh, she'll be able to, she's going to kind of explain some of the technical aspects of uh, what's going on, and, um, and again, I think you're going to like what you have to hear. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Wayne. All right, so the hard part of the meeting, the guidelines. Um, first of all, we do have a limited number of hard copies of the presentation over on the sign-in desk, which reminds me to ask you to sign in. We appreciate staying in touch with you and trying to keep you informed. Um, please hold your questions to the end of the uh, presentation from CBNI. Uh, that gives us all a chance to think things over and formulate the questions for information you really desire. One question per comment at a time. We're asking that you have three minutes and that you approach the microphone. We're gonna ask that you respect everybody's ability to ask questions and make comments by sticking to a three minute time limit. 
and I will quietly remind you when you have 30 seconds left so you can draw to the end of your question if you would. Um, in addition, and I noticed a bunch of people picking them up, we have uh, some comment cards, and before we start the q and I'll ask you just to hold those up so we can collect them and so we can try to address your question if you don't feel like coming to the microphone. Um, oh, uh, finally, the uh, fact portion of everything that goes on in this meeting and questions that we take will be posted up on the website along with this presentation. And uh, you're welcome to go there at any time. And the website's at the bottom of the slide. And we can give that to you. And it is also on the informational handout over on the desk. So without further ado, let's move to the next slide. All right, we went through introductions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce from CBNI Dr. Michael Amdur, who will give us an update on the work that CBNI has accomplished since the last quarterly meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. So I'm, I'm Mike Hamder. I'm the project manager for CBNI on this project. Um, and uh, what, I, what we're going to focus on today is uh, some of the interim measures we've been taking and where those stand. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, a list of acronyms. Um, we'll just skip through these, uh, but they are in the handout. You see them every quarter. They haven't changed. It's hard to hear you. OK. Project background, a real quick reminder. The base, um, the bulk fuel facility operated between 1953 and 99 uh, when the leak was first discovered. Uh, that facility was removed from service then and a new facility uh, put in place that was above ground and contained to uh, prevent any f future leaks. Three types of jet fuel were stored there, Avgas, which is what contains the EDB, JP4, and JP8. And Avgas and JP4 were phased out, as you see up on the slide here. Uh, JP8 continues to be used. And as I said, the uh, EDB or 1,2-dibromoethane is uh, an Avgas component. Uh, the first remedial actions were when a soil vapor extraction system was installed in 2003 to begin removing vapor from the subsurface. Um, investigation activities, and actually that should say 2001, first identified um, jet fuel in the groundwater, and um, investigation started following that point. Uh, three additional units for soil vapor extraction were added in 2008-9, and um, another system was installed in 2013, which we call the CADOX system. Next one. This is a conceptual site model, and basically um, the source area of the fuel spill took place on the surface. It percolated through the subsurface down to the water table and uh, created a body of non-aqueous phase liquid, NAPL, um, at the water table. And from this NAPL zone, contaminants have dissolved out into the groundwater, particularly EDB, and are moving um, to the north, northeast uh, towards the Ridgecrest Wells. And that's, that's the key concern that the EDB has, has moved off site. There's still a body of NAPL in the subsurface, in the meantime, the groundwater table in the past five years has risen about 10 feet. And so this napal that used to be floating on the water table, because it's less dense than water, like, like oil floats on water, has been flooded as the water table has, has come up. So that's, that's changed some of the focus and some of the remediation. We'll talk a little bit about that. Next, please. Um, you, you guys, those of that have been coming to the meeting have seen this slide before. And it basically, it's hard to read from the back. I know we have a, uh, a version of it uh, in hard copy here, which I'll put up. And um, I think I'll skip this one in the interest of time. But basically what it does is it shows the time history since uh, CB and I started working here of performing the groundwater investigation, the soil vapor investigation, writing the uh, RECRA facility investigation report, and the various inter interim measures that we've performed, including the soil vapor extraction, um, starting on a, an LNAPL interim measure and a downgrade in EDB interim measure and continued um, monitoring. Next one. So what, what we've done in the past quarter, we submitted a risk assessment report to NMED. We submitted our first quarter 2014 regular report. Um, we have begun excavating contaminant soil at the 
former fuel offloading rack. That, that's the source of the initial spill. And I'll show you a couple of slides about that. And we also uh, installed a pilot test of a system called AirSparge SVE, um, which started operating June 30th. And I'll show you a couple of slides on that to illustrate it. OK, I'll skip next to the next slide. Uh, this is the EDB plume first quarter 2014. Uh, essentially has not moved tremendously. It's not observable difference. Uh, the spill area was down here. Um, the NAPLE footprint is this red dotted line that you can see here. Then uh, this is the dissolved down gradient EDB. Uh, base um, boundary is, is this black line here. Um, and, and one thing to, to point out is that as you go from the core of the NAPLE plume here to this down gradient, the concentration of EDB drops by two to three orders of magnitude. And as we uh, reported in the RFI report, there's very strong evidence that the EDB is undergoing biological breakdown by the natural microbes in the subsurface, along with the benzene and all the other fuel components. Next, please. Now, this is the benzene plume. Uh, again, it, it is basically contained within the former NAPLE area. Once you get out of that area down gradient, um, it's non-detect. And again, we have very strong evidence that the, the benzene and other fuel components are being broken down by the microbes in the subsurface, um, just like ultimately the microbes break down the oil spill from the Horizon oil well that, that leaked in the Gulf of Mexico a number of years ago. It takes a while, but they, they eventually break it down. So this is a, the core of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's five different things I'm going to talk about. The soil vapor extraction system that's operating, the air sparge SVE system that we just installed, the excavation that's ongoing now, uh, proposed future interim measure to enhance this ongoing biodegradation in the subsurface, and then a uh, pump and treat interim measure to capture EDB um, as it escapes from that core, core area before it gets to the down gradient area. SVE system, um, the, uh, a, a new system was installed about a year and a half ago. Um, we connected uh, a number of additional extraction wells um, about four months ago. The system is currently destroying about 70 pounds per hour of hydrocarbons. And um, we have proposed um, a, an additional SVE system. We're in discussions with NMED now on size and location of it. Um, but uh, it's a, a replacement of the, uh, the thermal system that we have now with a larger system, addition of four new wells, and extracting about three and a half times as much uh, soil vapor from the subsurface as we currently are doing. Uh, we sent this uh, proposal into NMED, and as I said, we're, we're, dis we're discussing the details of it. This is a curve that shows the total amount of hydrocarbons that have been removed from the subsurface since 2003, when the SVE system was first installed. Um, it's dotted here because we don't have month-by-month -month data from back then, but this is basically a cumulative removal curve month-by-month -month, um, of total hydrocarbon removed, and as you can see, we're at about 3.2, 3.3 million pounds, which equates to about 500,000 gallons. And this, this removal process, again, is, is, from, is soil vapor from what's called the Vado zone between the ground surface and the, and the groundwater at about 480 feet down. It's removing the, the uh, hydrocarbons that have vaporized, just like when you spill gasoline on the ground, it vaporizes, um, it volatilizes. Well, it happens in the subsurface, too, and if you suck the air out with those vapors, you can uh, trap the vapors and treat them. The air sparge SVE pilot test. The objective here, again, in this case, we are blowing air into the groundwater and trying to move those volatile vapors from the groundwater, uh, EDB, benzene, and other contaminants, into the Vado zone right above that, and then, then use SVE again, that same process of sucking the vapors out of the Vado zone to capture it. So it's kind of a two-step process. You blow air into the groundwater, to move the vapors out of the groundwater, and then you capture it with soil vapor extraction, bring it to the surface, and treat it. 
Uh, we installed this system, it's uh, just south of Ridgecrest. Um, we're pumping uh, air into the groundwater to strip contaminants, and then we're extracting um, the vapors, pumping it through carbon absorbers which remove uh, whatever vapors have been extracted. And the objective of this pilot test is to see how much can we remove through this type of a system before it moves further down gradient into that down gradient footprint. This is what the system looks like. There's a single well that has uh, within it two wells, um, a single boring. The air sparge well goes down below the water table, blows air into the, into the shallow groundwater. That air vaporizes the contaminants which move into the, the unsaturated zone right above the water table where they're captured by this SVE vacuum system. Basically it vacuums uh, these contaminants out of the subsurface and then through a treatment system. Uh, one, back one, please. Um, what we're doing is we have a monitoring well that's about 25 feet down gradient from the system. And the object objective is to measure uh, EDB and benzene before we turn the system on. And then as we sparge those contaminants out of the subsurface to measure the concentrations in groundwater at this monitoring well. And uh, that, that will show the effectiveness of moving those contaminants out of the water by decreasing concentrations in the monitoring well. The next one, the excavation in the actual spill area. Uh, we are planning to excavate about 1,700 cubic yards of contaminated soil that exceeds the state's residential soil screening levels to a depth of up to 20 feet below the surface. Um, we began excavation uh, about two weeks ago. To date, we've removed about 400 cubic yards. We expect to be completed uh, in the next two months. And this is simply, excavation, simply excavating the contaminated soil out of the ground, putting it in trucks, and taking it to a nearby landfill that's permitted to accept uh, that material. The way we figured out how much we had to excavate was we went along the former pipeline where the leaks were, and we took about 1,700 samples. And where the sample nearest to the pipeline had contamination, we did what we call a step-out sample. We went out another few feet, took another sample, and measured it. And if that was still contaminated, we went out another few feet and took a sample. So we defined the volume that was contaminated through this process. And um, most of the, the leakage was right by this 90-degree this bend in the pipe. In fact, when the pipe was taken out of the ground, they found a hole in the pipe. Um, so based on that, this is a, a blow-up of this area. Based on that, we have identified the areas that, um, that require excavation, and that's what we're currently doing. And this is a picture of, of the process. Um, this is called a trench box, and basically what it does is it holds the walls of the excavation open. And so as you excavate inside this box, the box slides down and the walls don't collapse and you are able to remove the volume of soil required. And then you move the trench box over and do it over, um, and you step your way down through the area to be excavated. And that's currently going on. Uh, the next one, in situ biodegradation. Again, as, as I mentioned, um, there's a, a lot of uh, lines of evidence to indicate there's natural biodegradation going on. What we want to do is figure out how can we enhance that? Um, how can we um, give additional nutrients to the microbes, for example, so that they will biodegrade more rapidly? And this is a three-step process. Um, also, there's, there's, uh, EDB has a, a chemical breakdown process that we're looking at that doesn't involve microbes, but that's, that's a, a level of detail I don't want to get to right now. Um, the first step is an, a lab study where we take groundwater and soil from the subsurface, from the middle of the contaminated zone, and, and put it in what's called microcosms and add all sorts of different amendments. Um, we add nutrients, we add sulfate, uh, we, we change the pH, and we do various experiments to see under what conditions will the microbes most rapidly break down the contaminants, focusing primarily on EDB and benzene. And this is a lab study ongoing now. We've been doing it for about a month and a half. It'll take about six months to, to go through, 
and we'll be evaluating the data and identifying what mix. I mean, think about fertilizing plants. That's basically what we're doing. We're trying to fertilize the microbes in the subsurface so they grow faster and therefore break down the contaminants faster. The more microbes you have, the more they propagate, the bigger your plants are, the quicker the breakdown. The next step is called a push-pull test, um, and that's a field test in which we take a small volume of, of water out of the ground, add these amendments, the, whatever the best mix we find in the lab, and put it back into the ground and, and measure over a period of time by sampling what actually happens in the subsurface. Because you, know, you can do stuff in the lab, but you want to know whether it's really going to work in the ground before you start building a, a full system. And then the final step is a potential full-scale uh, treatment system. Next slide. Here's just a picture of the, these microcosms are about a liter and a half bottles, and uh, the slab tech is, is sampling from them. And again, they, they sample routinely over a six-month period to measure the breakdown of the contaminants under these various treatments. And th this is a conceptual uh, picture of an in-situ groundwater recirculation system. Basically, the idea is once you've figured out what the best nutrients are, um, you pump the nutrients into the subsurface th through the contaminated zone uh, where the microbes are being fed and growing and breaking down the contamination. Then you capture that down gradient, pump it up, and recirculate it through the subsurface. And the, the reason to recirculate it is just to get it mixed faster because groundwater in the subsurface doesn't move all that fast. But if you're recirculating it, you can keep the process going, you can speed it up. Um, and so this is, this is a, a long-term uh, conceptual uh, approach to remediating the, uh, the NAPL area itself. And there are other uh, approaches we're also looking at. The uh, pump and treat interim measure, um, objective of this one, and we're just currently developing it right now, uh, working with the regulators and other uh, stakeholders, is to capture high concentrations of dissolved phase, so this is not in the NAPL, but just beyond that area, um, contaminants, primarily EDB, before they move off the base and, and, and to the northeast. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to pump 50 to 100 gallons per minute of water out of a, a well, pipe it underground to the base, build a treatment facility so that the water meets uh, all the drinking water standards, and then we're looking at different alternatives for how to reuse or recycle that water, uh, re-inject it, uh, what, what we'll do with that water after it's treated. Again, this is an interim measure to capture the EDB and benzene, primarily the EDB, because the benzene really is, is stuck in that core area um, before it flows down gradient and off base and toward the Ridgecrest Wells. Um, and uh, this is, again, a conceptual model of that. It's very simple. An extraction well pumping uh, the contamination out of the ground um, north of the uh, fence line of Kirtland, uh, putting it through a treatment building on base, and, uh, and then um, we, we're still working on what we'll do with that water, how, how we can most effectively reuse it. And looking forward, um, we have submitted uh, re um, requisite facility investigation reports um, and a risk assessment to NMED uh, before we move into what's called the corrective measures evaluation. Uh, that these reports need to be approved and any additional work that needs to be done uh, has to be taken care of. Continue quarterly sampling. Continue operating the current soil vapor extraction system until the new one that I was talking about is put in place, the expanded system. Um, Complete the excavation that I talked about. Complete the, the lab study and do the, that in-situ push-pull test. And based on that, determine whether the full-scale in-situ recirculation is a viable process. Um, we might be using Kirtland well one. This is the original, uh, this is the aquifer test well for those that have been through the process and the original um, proposed containment well, uh, we might be using that well or installing another one nearby for this um, plume capture. Um, we talked about that. And then finally, once the record re facility investigations are complete, the corrective measures evaluation looks at the 
um, RICRA-driven final remedy, um, evaluates all the different alternatives, comes up with a recommended set of alternatives that then the regulator reviews and approves, um, and that is implemented. But in the meantime, we're, we're doing all of these interim measures and we'll be doing other interim measures. And uh, that's it for me. Before we move to discussion and questions, uh, just a few reminders. If you've already annotated a comment card with a question or comment, could you hold it up right now so we can collect those real quick? We want to make sure your questions get answered if you don't uh, want to consider coming to the mic. The second thing I need to do, uh, Colonel Houghton mentioned it, but I have a new coworker, uh, Dr. Adrienne Bedour came to visit us last week. Uh, she's been here two weeks now, and I'm proud to introduce Dr. Adrienne Bedour. Thanks, Wayne. Hi, my name is Adrienne Bedour, just like you said. Um, yes, I have a doctorate. My doctorate actually is in specializing in bioremediation and remediation solutions, and so. Why I'm a new colleague of Wayne's, how did that come about? Um, you heard from Colonel Hott before that we have um, Ms. Ferguson, the louder, okay, I heard it, okay, <laughs> good signal. Um, we heard from uh, Ms. Ferguson, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Air Force, um, that we, the Air Force is committed to this problem and putting the best resources behind that problem. And so that, with that being said, that's why I'm here. They tapped uh, AFCAC in San Antonio. We are the branch that looks over both the programmatic and the budget and the acquisition for contracting mechanisms. Plus, we also have the technical directorate, which is where we have a lot of expertise in helping both in toxicology, chemistry, remediation, things along those lines. And so I was asked um, if I would be interested in coming here. And because I was born and raised here, I raised my hand and said, yes, I want to come home. I would love to come home. Maybe not under this exact circumstances, but I would love to come home. And so um, I volunteered uh, to help out. Um, not only do I have uh, the technical chops, but I also have a personal interest in this. Um, my family still lives here. My husband's family still lives here, too. And so I'm excited to be part of a team that tries to move forward to get us to a solution that helps us put a remedy in place or a corrective measure in place that will clean up this site in a timely manner so that we are not contaminating future groundwater and we do not contaminate drinking water in the future. So. Um, with that being said, um, I'm working hand in hand with Wayne and the base. Um, I've also brought in a technical team and I've been reaching out a lot to InMed and the Water Authority to work with them and bring their technical experts in and we are meeting and we're having a lot of discussions about how we can have a conceptual design sooner than later about how to clean up this site and then how we are gonna be able to put it on a schedule and meet that schedule. So hopefully that explains sort of where I am and where I'm coming from and why I've been brought here. Thanks, Dr. Berger. Um, I have three questions in my hand. If you guys don't mind, we'll address the written questions first and hopefully I can get you an answer before you leave today. Uh, the first one, the EPA says the SVE is not good for removing non-volatiles like benzene. Why are you trying to remove benzene using SVE? What other technology are you using now to remove benzene and other aromatics? Mike, can you fill that question for us? Yeah. Um, it, benzene actually does airstrip, in fact, better than EDB. Um, the semi-volatiles... Okay. Yeah. Ben benzene does actually vaporize, volatilize even better than EDB. You can airstrip benzene more easily than EDB. But with regard to the 
uh, semi-volatile organics, a heavier fraction in the oil that does not air strip. That's why we're looking at the in situ biodegradation because um, the microbes will break down all of the oil components in the subsurface. And so uh, that's a process to address the other heavier fraction of the, of the spill. Um, second question is, where is the landfill, I'm assuming, for the soil disposal? How, dis how, is, how is it disposed at the landfill? And who manages the landfill? There's also a question, where is the mayor? I'm not aware of the mayor's schedule, but I know he does get an invitation to the cab meetings. Okay. Um, Talking about the soil. Yeah, the, the landfill is at Los Lunes. It is a waste management commercial landfill that is permitted to take the soil. We analyze the con concentration of contaminants in the soil before it's sent off site. Um, so that we know that it is within the criteria that that landfill is licensed to take. What was the next question? Who manages the landfill? Uh, it's, it's a commercial uh, landfill uh, managed by waste management. Uh, Valencia County. An air sparger unit was installed at Ridgecrest Place and Ridgecrest Drive. What is the function of this unit? It was shown today. Um, is there a vacuum at this site? And how are the emissions controlled? Yeah, there, the SVE is the vacuum process. The SVE is the vacuum process. And uh, it collects what the contaminants that are sparged from the groundwater. That, uh, soil air and soil vapor goes through a treatment system on the surface that consists of two beds of activated carbon uh, that remove all of the contaminants in that airstream. All right, thank you. Unless somebody else has another written question. All right, now I'm, oh, we have one more. There we go. All right. Please provide examples of bioremediation uses in the past, citing size of the areas and time to complete cleaning to minimum EPA levels. Um, I, I think there are quite a number of examples in the poster session that we had uh, earlier. Are the posters still up? Yeah. Okay. So um, after, after this meeting, uh, if it's okay with you guys, uh, we can reconvene our, our experts at the posters that um, talked about a number of different examples where in situ bioremediation's uh, been done. Um, and it's a, it's a, we're, we're doing it at, at sites around the country for solvent plumes um, just like this. Uh, we've developed, uh, our company in fact has developed a bacteria uh, that's been applied over 500 times around the country and internationally that breaks down chlorinated solvents. And so um, there's, there's quite a lot of experience nationwide with this process. Thanks, Mike. All right. Oh, another one. All right. The cards and letters keep coming in. Um, when is the phase four SBE plan to start? Um, I would say at this point, sometime early next year, we're still talking with NMED about what the final configuration is going to be. Seeing no more written questions, I invite you to come one at a time, if you would, to the microphone if you have a comment or a question. Again, please try to keep it to three minutes. Uh, we respect you for your questions, and we hope you respect the rest of the audience for their ability to ask the same. Again, um, we're going to try to tie up the meeting by 7.30. That'll give those of you who weren't able to go through and see the posters a chance to do that. And we do have to be out of this facility by 8 o'clock. So that's just a reminder. If you can kind of keep your questions um, concise as possible, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, my name's Kurt Crumperman. I live in Knob Hill. Um, you can't hear me? Okay, how's this? Very good, all right. Okay, 
Uh, my name's Kurt Krumperman. I live in Knob Hill. Um, my question is like two part. There's been regulatory agencies, the uh, Bernalillo, uh, Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Authority and the NMED who have put requirements on this uh, process of cleaning up. The Water Authority said in the last meeting back a month ago that zero was the amount of contamination that was acceptable in the, in the drinking water. And NMED said that if cleanup activities did not begin by June 30th, this is my understanding, that, that you, the, the Air Force Base would be facing fines of $10,000 a day. Some clean activities have begun, but it doesn't seem like all the ones have begun, and I'm wondering if you are now experiencing fines or not, and what's the impact of the um, ath water authorities' zero contamination uh, resolution on your uh, cleanup plan? Um, and finally, when is the um, uh, pump and treat option going to be put into place? What's the date, expected date for that? So those are the three questions. All right. Let me try to handle part of that. First of all, the MCL that's regulated by New Mexico Environment Department, the standard that we're held to is not zero. That's a, that's a that's a standard that the WA would like us to try to meet. They would encourage everyone to try to meet that. The standard of 0 0.05 micrograms per liter for EDB is what, will we be, what we will be regulated to and what our final corrective action will achieve. It has to achieve that. Um, as far as the pump and treat system going into place, that is currently being reviewed by Dr. Boudoura and her team to help us move quickly and efficiently to hopefully put that in place. There's a lot of uh, extenuating items that affect that, and those are things that are being considered that we have to iron out to make this thing happen on time. The, the letter that we received that described a $10,000 fine was in the event that we were not on time delivering our corrective measure, our interim measure, by June 30th. That's my recollection of that letter, and that's all it extended to. I hope I have that right. Nobody's shaking their head sideways. Good, I have that. I think I addressed all three of your questions. The pump and treat, right now, the technology to remove EDB is supposed to happen by the 31st of December. <coughs> I'm sorry? You mean the building? It's a, you're going to attach it to a plant that's currently in Air Force Base. When is that going to be built? Mike, can you help me with that? I'm not asking anything. <laughs> yeah, the, Mines are simple. <laughs> the, 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 goal, the goal is December 31st. We're still discussing, as you saw, what do we do with the water once we've treated it? And there are various regula regulatory agencies um, that we have to get permits from depending on where we put the water. Um, so we have to go through that process, discuss it with the regulators uh, to put a full schedule together. Um, that we would be able to project when that would be uh, in place. But essentially, we've started a work plan for it. We're working with Dr. Boudour on various alternatives, um, including um, where we're going to take the water out of the ground and what we're going to do once it's treated. Just one question at a time. Yeah, Dr. Nutt. <laughs> Yeah, my name's Eric Nuttall, um, Professor Emeritus from the University of New Mexico and with ITRC. Mike, I have a question for you when you get through talking. Mike. <laughs> I have a question for you, Mike, since it was your talk. 
Um, we've heard a lot about the estimates of mass for the oil spill, you know, from 6 to 24 million gallons, and I, I don't want to run through that again. What I haven't heard are the mass and fate estimates for ethylene dibromide. And I guess my concerns are, you know, I saw your one well out to the side. Um, that's the first time I've ever seen you even begin to mention ethylene dibromide. I may be wrong. I'd like to know where it is. I'd like to know where it's in the SVE system. I'd like to know how much mass is in the groundwater of, you know, estimates. I realize there's air bars. And I'd like to know the fate and transport. I'd like to know chemically how it's bound in the smear zones and how big the smear zone is and equilibrium and release and so on. I'd like to hear about ethylene dibromide, and I really think that technically um, you must have thought about it because that's what you're going after, but it's something we never hear about. So I'd like to give you a chance to educate me on ethylene dibromide. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that right now because um, of time constraints, I, but we will take this under advisement. We've started looking at a, a mass balance of how much ethylene dibromide is in the source area versus in the upgradient. Um, the, the figure of 80% is incorrect because it's on an area basis, not a concentration, not a mass basis. Most of the mass of the EDB is still in the original spill area. We're working on that. In terms of giving you the, a dissertation on the physical chemical characteristics of EDB, I can't do that right now. I'd have to get our experts together but we will take it under advisement. Sorry? The answers to those questions be provided in writing. I don't see why not, yes. Maureen May, Albuquerque. Um, first of all, I want to welcome new, new members um, from the, uh, Kirtland. Um, as you, as you have more of these meetings, I think you'll understand that there are people here who have um, watched the inaction over months and years. So there's a lot of skepticism among the within the community. Um, our water authority represents elected officials, people that we elect. And I just heard you say that you are leaving as an option to ignore their decision to say that we would have 0, 0.0 part of EDB or EDP, whichever it is, in our drinking water. And I find that to be um, very arrogant on the part of the Air Force to say that they can ignore the elected officials of our community. Unless I misunderstood you. Yes, ma'am. What I said and what I'll repeat again is that this cleanup activity, this, uh, the full activity that we're doing is regulated under RICRA by the New Mexico Environment Department. And the standard that we're held to is the maximum contaminant level. And in the case of EDB, that's 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. That's what our cleanup efforts will be regulated against. So you are going to ignore the Water Authority? No, ma'am. I think, I think you are hedging because that's exactly what you're saying. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Steve Pierce, and I live on Loveless Road in the Siesta Hills neighborhood. And like many of my neighbors and friends, we are all homeowners, and this contamination has moved beyond the Air Force Base and into our neighborhood. And this is a question that I've been asking now for close to two years, and I've not been able to get answers from NMED, the mayor's office, or the real estate board. I've also asked our elected officials. And so I come tonight to ask the question of you. There is a property disclosure statement that is required on property sales for real estate. Under state law, sellers are not required to disclose any known facts about their property or the surrounding area. However, mortgage providers 
including FHA, VA, and most every conventional mortgage company, requires the seller of a property to complete accurately a disclosure statement. And so the question that I have is what we are supposed to do when we come to this question. And it's under the environmental heading of the New Mexico property disclosure statement, and it says, is the seller aware of any hazards or hazardous materials on or in close proximity to the property, such as asbestos, dumps, pesticides, chemical labs, underground fuel storage tanks, or leaks. Now the problem is, we all are here tonight, are aware of what has happened with this fuel spreading into our neighborhood. And this needs to be completed accurately. But what will happen when this is filled out accurately is mortgage companies, including FHA and VH, I'm sorry, FHA and VA, will no longer loan on properties that are in this area with this disclosure statement. This is a real problem for our community. So it's not just a matter of EDBs, SVEs, and all these particulates that you, and, and, and materials that you're talking about, but it is impacting our neighborhood and our community. So time is of the essence. We really need some assistance in moving forward. And Colonel, I wanted to thank you and welcome you to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Ailey. Um, I, first, I'd like to comment, I don't understand why you hold these events at this uh, uh, community center because they don't have internet access here, which means that the people can't interface with social media. You know, this is the 21st century, I think. I, you know, we have technology, you know, and is that a, a, an intentional effort to keep us from communicating with the outside world while we're in here. We could be live streaming this event uh, so everybody in the city could see it. This is a huge issue. And I think you people are intentionally keeping it out of the public eye. And I don't, I don't think, I mean this echo in here, you can't even understand what people are saying. This is ridiculous. You can, you can afford uh, huge bombers out there, but you can't afford to, to get a venue that people can understand what's going on. I just don't understand it. You know, this is, you know. So where are you gonna put this water? Tell me where you're considering putting the water. So Dr. Amadur has already explained that the pump and treat system that's being designed, being discussed, one of the major factors that still has to be corrected is, I'm sorry, determined, is exactly what you just said, what to do with that water that has not been determined yet. Well, I'm sure you kicked it design. around, you know, about where you might dump this water. You must have some idea, because you're gonna have to have some idea to figure out where you're gonna have to get a permit. All I can tell you on that is it will be legally handled when that method. So you're going to keep it secret till the last minute and drop it on everybody, just like treating it. You're, what you're talking about now. Nobody's talked about this before, as far as I know. I believe you know. I'm taking it that you know that the work plan for this effort will have to be um, delivered to the New Mexico Environment Department which will include how we intend on handling the water. With they no public, with no public input. It'll be delivered to the New Mexico Environment Department. Thanks. My name is Willard Hunter. Uh, before I had my comment, um, there was a question raised by a homeowner and you didn't answer it. What is the Air Force gonna do to make the homeowners that want to sell their property whole. Can you give us an answer to that before my question? No, sir, I can't. And what's the thing about near? How near is near? <laughs> Which is closer. I understand. Okay, so when are you going to have a written answer to that question? We will take that question back and give it to our legal advisors. Okay, so we can expect a written answer. Yes, sir. Okay, so my question oh, is... I hope to post that in the fact that's listed on our webpage. 
because there are a lot of people going to be very interested in that. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you have this really nice picture of these uh, trench boxes and the excavation, and you have this nice map of the uh, FFOR sampling. And in, out in the other room, you have a, a display on this, and you talk about this in the present tense, like yes, this is going on now. Yes, sir. So you discovered this leak in 1999. It's 15 years later. Why in heaven's name have you not been excavating this contamination out of the soil starting when you discovered it? Again, our regulators, the New Mexico Environment Department, directed us to submit a plan for investigation and characterization of that soil. That plan had to be approved. It had to be installed and used. That sampling had to occur. The data had to be collected and reported to the regulatory authority. They then approved the data and gave us the go ahead to start excavation of that soil. And that process took 15 years. No, sir, that process took the better part of three years. So why didn't you start that process in 1999 when you discovered the leak? when you claim to have discovered the leak. That was not part of the work at the time. So you, you know, one of the things that really irritates me about the Air Force is all of you folks are new and none of you were here when this took place and you, none of you take responsibility for what happened and the Air Force doesn't take responsibility. It's really, really frustrating what, what you folks are doing. Not my fault, I wasn't here, it didn't happen on my shift. I'm just trying to remediate it. Yes, ma'am. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Holly Wilkie. I'm a student of geology. And I, um, many of the piezometers used to monitor the extent of the plume have been rendered um, ineffective by aquifer gains or recovery in the aquifer. Do you have any plans or do you have a timeline for replacing those piezometers or sentinel wells? No, not this time. I'm looking at the contractor. Okay, that was my question. Hi, I'm David Barnaby um, from the Ridgecrest area. Um, I just had one question and then one comment. Um, what is the total, what's your estimate of the total amount of fuel that has leaked in? And the reason I ask that, you've got several good figures for how much you can pump, so I can give an hour or day estimate, but I don't know what the total is. So I can't say how many years it might take to extract it. Uh, our estimate of the total, which is in the RFI report, is about 6 million gallons total. Most of that is in the El Napal zone and uh, in the groundwater. The amount in the soil, our estimate is, I believe, about 15% of that, so 800,000, 900,000 gallons. But most of that has gotten down to the groundwater and is either sitting in a separate phase, which we call El Napal, or has dissolved into the groundwater. So let me get that straight. Six million gallons, not pounds, six million gallons in, uh, on top of the water. Most, most of that is either on top of the water or is dissolved into the water. Okay, and then something like 15% in the soil, but you're anticipating that's going to seep down into the water. Um, we believe that most of what has seeped down into the water has already done it over the past 40 or 50 years since the spill. Hmm. But the soil vapor extraction of the Vado zone, which is from the groundwater to the surface of the ground, is focused on removing the remaining fuel that is um, in, that, in that area. Okay. So you have one graph that you suggested that was about 500,000 gallons removed so far. Correct. If, if you continue that rate, then it's going to take you 12 years to extract, assuming you could get it all. Uh, from, from, the, from the Vedo zone, yes. Okay. But the amount that you can extract goes down as you reduce the concentrations. Right. Okay. Uh, now, my comment is for everyone else who's talking about your property value. 
there's a, the city of Albuquerque is developing an area called Mesa del Sol, which is west of the airport and the base. The base went to the city and said, you have to tell the homeowners full disclosure. The army used that area as an artillery range in World War II. There is unexplored ordnance out there. I guarantee it. There was also an area where an atomic bomb had an accident and spread radioactive material out there. Now today, that radioactive material has decayed to the point that it's no health danger to you or me any more than the air that we breathe in New Mexico, which is contaminated with radioactive material because guess what? We live on top of uranium. But I guarantee this, some child is gonna live there and they're gonna come down with some weird brain cancer and that family's gonna hire a lawyer and they're gonna discover there that there was an atomic bomb dropped there one time and that lawyer is gonna sue the United States government because somehow they're responsible even though the city of Albuquerque is the one who's responsible for making sure the people selling that property to you do full disclosure. It's not the United States government. They've disclosed it. Sir, you have 30 seconds. So you go to, your, you go to the members of your city council and say, what are we going to do about this? And oh, by the way, Mesa de Sol has dangers are you forcing the people who are going to sell that property to do full disclosure? I doubt it. But don't blame the United States government. They've already disclosed it. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Marion Jordan, and um, I'm the president of Elder Homestead Neighborhood Association, which is located right outside, on the other side of Louisiana, to uh, San Pedro. And uh, most, of, a lot of the people in my area, they are not, uh, they really don't know that much about technology. Uh, well, a lot of them do, but some don't. And what they're asking me is, uh, they want to know if the fuel spill has penetrated the earth underneath our houses. Can you tell me? I'm, I'm trying to put the map of your neighborhood in my head. So it's right on the other side so of Louisiana. If you consider that the groundwater travels underneath the general area of your neighborhood, yes. then you would have to say yes. that there is fuel contaminant in the soil underneath your homes. Remembering that on average, it's most likely around 500 feet below your homes. But, the but it is that question there, was you're saying. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. You guys may have covered this, I'm not sure, but uh, so my question is, what do you recommend for citizens that have well water as their primary drinking source? We aren't going to be on the city of Albuquerque's system to sort of clean this up. So how often do you think we should have our water tested? I'm not sure if, how exactly to, to phrase this question, but I'm looking for something on terms of how do I know my water is safe when I'm not going to be treated from the city of Albuquerque's treatment plants? Uh, yes, ma'am. When we first started this effort, I can tell you that we did a record search for the area affected by the plume. Mm -hmm. There were only two known private wells in the area, okay. and both those are uh, permitted for irrigation only. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be anyone in the vicinity of the plume who is pulling their drinking water uh, through a private well. For how long? Assuming I'm, that this plume doesn't spread any further, I guess, is what you're basing it on, right? Yes, ma'am, from won't. what we know about the plume and the way the plume's characterized right now. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, I have a question. Okay, sure. so the, since the soil is affected, right? That is what you're trying to say. It, you need to hold the mic close to your mouth. Okay. You well, since what you're saying is if since the soil is affected, right? Is it safe to garden in the area that the soil is affected on? So, I know you don't live in the middle of the bulk fuels facility, and I'm guessing you don't live on base between the bulk fuels facility and the boundary, and the soil contamination that we know of at or near the surface is located on base inside that bulk fuels facility. So you shouldn't be experiencing any contaminated soil on the surface unless that soil was brought in from a different location. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It would probably be helpful if on your maps you, you gave the depth of the water table. I think a lot of people don't realize how far down it is, that it's around here, 500 feet to 700 feet. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the first I've heard about going over the old pipeline and testing the soil there. Does that mean that the contamination has come to the surface there, or do they have to dig down to find the soil to remove? No, ma'am. That's the, that's the initial location where we believe we had the leak. Right. Um, those of us that have been in Albuquerque area for a while and around Kirtland Air Force Base might remember there used to be a train track that ran around the end of the runway. And that's how the train used to come in to deliver the fuel to the offloading rack where we uh, found the leak. And then it was pumped to storage tanks so it could be delivered out to the aircraft. So, so um, that's, that's where the initial contamination was. And the pipe was roughly 15 feet below ground. And so that's it went up from there, down from there? It just saturated that soil uh, right at that okay. area. I've been coming to these meetings for years, and it's the first I heard of, of that going along that pipeline and, and doing that. Maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention. Yes, ma'am, we... Um, Mostly it's I'm, been about the El Napple. I'm trying to remember back, but I'm pretty sure that we discussed that plan for doing the investigation. Oh, I, I guess this is the first time I've seen a map sample. of it. But where, we will uh, where they take were. that note, and that is a good idea to start showing the depth of groundwater on the maps. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Submitted to NMED for their review and comments. We are waiting those comments back. If they are in agreement with our characterization, then that would uh, tell us that that our work is done as far as investigation is going, and we can move forward with corrective action. Uh, so, so uh, and just one more question: okay. uh, Do you have monitors close to the um, uh, the source wells for? Uh, ADB? Are you monitoring the source wells for traces of so I'm, EDB? I'm assuming you're talking about Ridgecrest 3 and 5. Is that the source wells you're referring to? Whatever source wells that are uh, of concern. Yes, we do. So you do have uh, a monitor there for ADB close to the wells? Cl close to the wells, yes. Okay. And uh, is the information from uh, those monitoring wells public, made public? Yes, ma'am. It's reported quarterly, actually. It's on our public record as well as NMED's public record. And that information is always there. And have you found any traces of EDB? It, it would, you would have to be specific about a specific well, but the northernmost wells, we have not. You have found traces? of EDB in the northernmost well, we have not. Uh -huh. So what, um, what are you going to do about that? About not finding it? About it finding trace, you said you found trace No, ma'am, I said we have not found traces in the oh, northernmost well. I see, so you have found no traces of EDB near any of the source wells. In our northernmost monitoring wells, we have not found traces of EDB. Have you found traces of EDB in any of the monitoring wells? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, refer to a map. 
Um, this is this is the uh, the map of the EDB plume that I showed at the beginning of my presentation. The source area is down here where the leak happened. Uh, this red dotted line is where the former extent of the NAPL, the free phase product was. This is where we found the EDB. These are wells that are do not have EDB in them. And here's Ridgecrest Well 3, and Ridgecrest 5 is, is up in this area. So where did, where did you find EDB close to a source well? Can you show me that? This, this, is, this is EDB in here. Mm -hmm. And where are the source wells? Is this a source well? Uh, this, this is a VA well. Are there source wells in here? By source, you mean drinking water wells? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Ridgecrest 3, Ridgecrest 5. And VA. So do you have a monitoring uh, well here by the we, VA? We have these ones here that, that are, are, not, are clean. Uh -huh. And none of these have shown EDB, like this one here? Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome to do second rounds. Please do. Um, again, Eric Nuttle, and I wanted to um, find out what your thinking is, uh, Mike and Rob, I guess, with reduction of EDB in the source area, which is already anaerobic, already has bacteria in it. Um, I understand and talked to Rob over at the poster, very nice poster, uh, very nice job. Appreciate the poster and the work that you all did. Um, but it's if you were going to get anaerobic degradation in the source area, which is already anaerobic, you would think that a lot of the EDB would be gone. Um, you know, I, I I understand out where you have uh, no petroleum products and no source carbon source and you're adding lactate, that's a different situation. And then one other issue that I might bring up is that EPA and, did I do that? EPA and a number of states have looked at in situ bioremediation at sites that are deep, which this counts, large, which this counts, and that in situ bioremediation is not cost effective. They really, um, there's a lot of literature out there to suggest that. It may be your only choice, I don't know. But, um, you know, go back to the first question and tell me how you're going to get EDB biologically out of the source area. Um, well, in the, we, we did something called a CSIA, compound specific isotope analysis, um, which tells you, the, C the CSIA tells you whether there is ongoing biodegradation. And based on that, uh, the calculation was in the order of 30 to 60 plus percent of the EDB um, is biodegrading in at either within the source area or at the edge of the source area. Um, and about 90 percent plus of the benzene. Um, there are multiple lines of evidence th that shows that there's ongoing biodegradation as well, just from the geochemistry. Uh, the idea is to enhance that process. Um, we are not going to see necessarily in the source area reductions in EDB concentration in the groundwater because the source, until you remove it slowly through biodegradation, will continue to leak EDB into the groundwater. Um, but uh, the, the, there's indisputable evidence that biodegradation is taking place. So, so to summarize, you think that the carbon that's there will degrade all of the EDB? We believe that the, the fuel components, the, the yeah, reg fuel. regular fuel components, are providing the carbon source for the EDB degradation. And, and Rob can talk again much more about the specifics of that, if you'd like. Yeah, the, 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 still the problem with uh, CSIA is it does not give you the rates um, it doesn't tell you really how fast you're getting degradation. 
Um, I hope that's the case, but one of your problems is to get rid of that source really fast. And, you know, it'd be nice to know, since it's still there, and it's there in big concentrations, and if you look at other sites, it has a big impact on what happens downstream, down at the toe. So you've got to get rid of that EDB source, and you've got to get rid of it fast. Um, if it were going fast, it would be gone. It's, it's not gone. It's in your highest concentration. So, um, and it's, it's a little bit biologically tricky to rely on the um, jet fuel, carbon and so on to do that degradation, which you really don't know the rate. But in, in accelerating it, are you thinking you can la add lactate? We're, right now we're doing an, a, a lab study that I talked about in one of my slides, and we're looking at a range of different additives, um, 11 different treatments that I don't have memorized, and Rob maybe does. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I couldn't remember me either. To, so. to, to, to look at what additives would enhance the rate, and also to measure the rate in the lab with soil and groundwater from the middle of the source area. So we, we put a new well in, we collected new soil, new groundwater, new contaminated soil and groundwater, sent it to the lab, and they put, it, put the, the soil in all of these microcosms, and they are actually currently will be, over the next six months, measuring the degradation rates. Okay, well, keep in mind my statement that EPA and others have investigated these large sites and deep sites, and it's not cost-effective, in their opinion, in their recommendation to do in situ bio, though we all love it. <laughs> Mr. McKay? Um, a couple... Comments about EDB, um, Mike, you s said tonight in rather certain fashion that it's, and correct me if I'm wrong or misquoting you, that EDB is naturally degrading. Um, we've looked at the data, we've talked to people with NMED who have studied this, perhaps under the BFF to a small extent, in the critical area out near the toe of the plume, we don't see any evidence that that, and that very little sampling has been done to determine the constituents that would give you the definitive information. And I'd also point out, at the last CAB meeting, you suggested that it may be naturally degrading out there, but we don't have evidence of it now or it's inconclusive, something to that effect. So that's one. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we've uh, done a lot of analysis, and in fact, some of the NMED folks have been looking at the data as well um, and have analyzed uh, what it's telling us. There's a huge amount of data that we've collected um, fortuitously over the past number of years, and we're looking at the geochemistry, all the indicators of degradation, um, and uh, presumably once we get this all together, it'll, I think NMED will be putting out a paper on it. Uh, but the question you mentioned, the, this area of the plume is anaerobic. There's no oxygen in here. Um, our evidence is that there is biodegradation going on within and at the edge of this footprint where the original NAPL was. As you go further to the north, the plume becomes more oxidizing, it becomes aerobic. And there is not much evidence that EDB breaks down aerobically. Okay. And so the issue really is, it's, it's breaking down in this area, but we need to do something else to control this. Biodegradation, unless, um, and the concentrations of EDB are so low up here that um, even if you try to stimulate biodegradation, the microbes essentially wouldn't see the EDB because the concentration is so low. They they metabolize whatever nutrients you try to give them. Um, Rob has done some studies looking at adding um, ethane or hydrogen in an aerobic environment uh, at MMR. Uh, those that were here earlier saw some of the posters that he had up there. Uh, but again, the, 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 the question is, will, will biodegradation be cost effective over such a large footprint 
with such a low concentration, and that's something that we're looking at. Okay, I'd like to summarize, because the reason I asked that was really for people here who don't pay close attention to that. So, what you're saying is, let's forget about cost effectiveness or low concentrations. As I understand it, you're saying it's not biodegrading or you don't have evidence of it out near the toe. So we're looking at other methods to control that. Pardon me? We are looking at other methods to control that. So, but it's not biodegrading out there, correct? To the best of your knowledge. To the best of our knowledge, correct. Okay. The other thing is, we have that dark area in the center near the toe. And you keep referring to these low concentrations. That's not a low concentration. That's way over the MCL. I've never heard you guys, Shaw, I've heard many of the others who study this stuff. Where's that coming from? Um, part, of, part of it is the contour interval. We chose one part per billion as a contour interval. It's what? The contouring interval. If, this, if we had chosen two parts per billion, that blob wouldn't be there. So in, in, in a sense, it's an artifact of we chose one part per billion. The question is, it is higher here. Why is it higher here? We don't exactly know. It's possible that when uh, that there were different pulses from the leaks, maybe the leak wasn't continuous, and some earlier leak spread further up, further north. It's also possible, uh, for those of you that were here um, a couple of calves ago, we talked about the groundwater and how it used to flow from the uh, northeast to the southwest towards the Rio Grande and how when these wells started pumping, starting in about 1975, 1980, the groundwater literally turned around 180 degrees. It's possible that this somehow got detached during that strange period in which the groundwater flow literally reversed. Uh, so the, ans the answer is I don't precisely know why it's higher here, but we need to look at it. Okay, I'd just like to make a comment without requiring an answer from you. We believe it's most likely that because your monitoring wells are so shallow and because the best information we've had from the aquifer are the least resistant pathways from underneath BFF to Ridgecrest 5 is at Ridgecrest 5 well screen depths, that the EDB is traveling well underneath your monitoring wells and for whatever reason surfacing there. And um, I know there's others who have looked at this who think that's a very real possibility. And it's troubling for us that, with all due respect, at these meetings, um, it seems minimized when you describe the toe there. You talk in terms of cost effectiveness and low MCLs when we aren't demanding an answer for where those high concentrations are coming from. And I know I don't want to. I don't want to uh, let that go any longer. I'd just also like to acknowledge, I know there's a lot of people here that have followed us on our website, what we do with this. There's been stepped up activity lately. There's some people who have started to put the pedal to the metal. The Air Force has brought in some people from their San Antonio um, environmental group. Dr. Um, Bodor, who spoke earlier, is leading that team. They've got some good ideas, there's some new energy, there's more money, it's, there's reason for optimism. Um, and I'd really suggest the citizens here who are increasingly becoming concerned about this to get more vocal with your representatives so that more money shows up because they're going to need more. With the governor, with the mayor, Udall, Heinrich, those guys. This needs to get more visible, more out front. There's people behind the signs, scenes beginning to acknowledge this. There's reason for promise now. It's time to make a big push and make sure we get over the hump. Thanks, Mr. McKay. Thanks for giving me a good segue. Um, I know we have a few more questions. We'll get to those. But I want to introduce um, Ms. Brenda Rush. She's from San Antonio, from AFCAC, and she she would like to talk about our new effort. Thank you. I just wanted to express our commitment from the Air Force Civil Eng Engineer Center. We're here supporting the Colonel Hout here in pulling out all the stops 
for the resources that are necessary. This is in direction from Ms. Kathleen Ferguson. She heard you, she listened, she heard your concerns. And, and as a result, you're seeing Dr. Badur. We pulled out our A-team. She has a significant amount of experience dealing with large plumes affecting public health at Hill Air Force Base and other bases. She not only has a stellar experience with this, she also has family in the area, so she has a personal interest. It worked out beautifully. We are pulling out our resources too. Financially, we're, we are making your public health a top priority in our program. Just to bring it to your attention, we have demonstrated that commitment from a resource standpoint. I want to thank the Water Authority and their involvement and Mark Sanchez talking with our director, Mr. Eldon Hicks and the Environmental Center. They were able to work out getting a resource for those Sentinel wells that happened in one month. We took our resource program and with the two of them working, we actually unfunded other things in our program that were not a public health risk in order to jam that in the program because that is our commitment to public health. We are committed. Kathleen Ferguson put us on our toes on that one. We all agree with her, and we are going to continue to demonstrate our commitment as an Air Force to ramp this up and demonstrate that to you in the physical environment. You're going to start seeing some things, and we are pulling out all the stops to show that to you. So please hold us accountable. We expect you to. It helps us keep all our folks on their toes, and we want the right solution in place. It is a team effort. Uh, Dr. Badur, did you want to get a little bit into some of the brainstorming? I know there's a lot of concern about what we're going to do with the water. A lot of this needs to be vetted by the Water Authority and NMED, which is what part of our reticence in talking about the brainstorming sessions. But be assured, none of the options we're exploring right now is to put it back into the potable water supply. Okay, it's to try and bring it back to the base and deal with it on base in an appropriate manner with the appropriate permitting. And that's what we're trying to work through right now. Did you want to get into some of that? But all this needs to be vetted and permitted, and there's a lot of processes and wickets we have to go through before it can be published. So that was part of the reticence. But be assured, none of the options I think that we're exploring is putting it back into the potable water supply. We do need to clean it to an MCL level, but putting it to the potable water supply is not part of the discussions that we are talking about right now. It's what are we going to do with it on base that's appropriate. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to remember to talk close. <laughs> okay, um, from a technical perspective, and what we want to try to do from a solution perspective is, is there's a couple issues. You're talking about water that's going to be pumped back onto the base. What do we do with that water? There are a lot of different ways that we can handle that water, and we don't have exact path forward, but I'm going to list a whole bunch of ideas off so that you know we're thinking and we're actually working towards this. So you can... Yes, with InMed and the Water Authority, because we've been having them come into technical sessions this week to answer these exact questions so that we can have a path forward for you guys that you can buy into, understand, and understand how we came to that, that it wasn't in some kind of vacuum bubble kind of system. I understand that's kind of how things have been operating. I don't operate that way. When you get to know me a little bit more, you're, you're going to find out I'm very transparent. I like to talk really honestly about stuff, and I'd like to be, I get committed to that you understand what we're talking about, too, because I was an educator in the past, and I like to teach, so sometimes I can be too teachy, but I do want you to understand what's going on here, both from, you know, a public concern, a technical concern, because the tech can talk really up here, okay, and I want to bring it down here, and you, if you have to ask me a lot of questions, we'll get down to here. So talking about the water associated with this, when we pump it up, there's a couple options. You can land applicate it in a percolation basin, okay? That means putting it on an, an emote type of situation, letting it percolate to the ground, okay? That's, that's an option. I'm not saying it's the number one option, okay? Another use for this is, is that we can use the water in industrial purposes, okay? Because we are cleaning this up to the MCL, we can utilize it in ways that we use portable water wastefully, okay? And what I mean by that is portable water is the water that is safe for you to drink, okay? Portable. Yeah, I know, it's a weird word. Um, <laughs> drinkable water, let's call it that, <laughs> okay? And so that water is what you drink and is for public consumption, is tested, make sure it's clean. The Water Authority has that regulation associated with that, okay? and make sure that the public is not getting exposed to both pathogens and contaminants, okay? So 
the other aspect of this is, okay, you pump with the water, you have, you percolate it through the ground. So we have industrial aspects of this. So can we reuse this water for um, cooling towers? Thank you, I couldn't think of the word. Cooling towers, can we reuse this water to water the golf course? That is a wasteful way to use a lot of water that's drinkable, but is safe for us to apply this water in an industrial way. And we now are not gonna be pulling up as much water from the groundwater, which helps in conservations and helps this water table rise. So those are definitely great options that we need to look at. And one of the things, part of that is, is I know that there is a purple water, gray water, that is industrial water that the city has, okay? Now, we have to communicate and figure out if we can give them our water and if they are wanting to give our water. They may not want us to do that, so that means we're back on the base and we're gonna reuse that water industrially on the base. To do that, we obviously have to put piping in. <laughs> we gotta make sure we get the distribution. We don't wanna confuse water line, drinkable water with industrial water, okay? For, for making that distinction. Another thing that you could do, and, and I'm not, again, suggesting this is the best option, but if you put the water into a lined basin that's impermeable, so it doesn't trickle down through the ground, then you're, you're relying on the mechanism of evaporation, okay? Now, some of you might say, that's very wasteful, okay? And I, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, but that may be an interim action as we get a full system in place to be able to handle all of the water that we're gonna need to deal with why we put a system forward. So getting onto the concept of is enhanced in situ bio something that we can do, it would be part of the process. Yes, it's very expensive to implement at this scale a, bio enhanced in situ bio it probably was not cost effective and has some limiting factors to it so i don't see that as the whole solution i see it as part of the solution my way of looking at this is breaking this to pull them up into segments and looking at how i can remediate those segments in an efficient effective manner to not waste your water resource but to attack and get this in the um, EDB out of the water, okay? We have to do that. And so this means that we're gonna use a treatment train process. There's gonna be SVE. There may be air sparging part of the system. There may be enhanced in situ bio recirculation to make sure that that works. Because each of these zones has some special areas where I think we can use different technologies strategically and optimize. And I really do think we can do it efficiently and effectively. Down gradient, where we're talking about that plume is aerobic and that degradation is not optimal right now, that is looking at an extraction technology like a pump and treat system. That is probably the best path forward, but we still have to discuss that with MMED and the Water Authority, but that's the conversations we're having this week. And it's very important that we can have all these open discussions from the different types of technologies that we can do so that we can come out with the best way forward and to put the system, to put, collapse this plume on itself. I, I know that sounds extreme, but that, that's what we're trying to do from a remediation perspective. The other thing I wanna say is, is that we have done this at plumes that are three miles long and a mile wide. And we did it in 10 years. Not EDB, chlorinated solvent, which in my opinion is more tricky than EDB from a contaminant perspective. So it can be done, but that was done with a treatment process. It was done with multiple technologies and it was doing it very systematically. It is no kidding around now kind of thing. So that, that's the approach. I've, I've been working hand in hand with Dennis. I don't mean to call you out. Raise your hand, Dennis, okay? Dennis has is, is become the lead at MMED, and we've been working together and talking about this a lot in the last week, and I have his team. I also have um, people from the Water Authority 
coming to this and we are sitting down and having all of these discussions and trying to come up with a conceptual model of what is the plan, what is it going to take, and then start to figure out the time and the budget that is associated with that. Because I've got to get know what I'm dealing with money-wise so I can get it under a contract, so I can get it awarded, and so I can move forward. Some people may not be able to hear you. You mentioned the state engineer has to give us a permit. That is absolutely correct, and we're aware of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And then additionally, she was mentioning the, the contract that needs to be put in place. Simultaneously, as Dr. Badur is trying to orchestrate and facilitate a reasonable and appropriate and expedited solution with all the stakeholders that we can all nod our head to, all of us, at the same time, I've been meeting with the Corps of Engineers. I did so today, including their colonel with the head of contracting, to make sure with CBNI and our project managers to make sure, okay, once the solution is determined, how do we contractually make this happen seamlessly with no delay, with resourcing? So we brainstormed a variety of solutions with the Corps of Engineers so that the instant the solution is determined, we can seamlessly, without any delay, resource it and get it on contract. And we, did, we had a very effective succession today with our contracting counterparts in the Corps of Engineers. I offered to resource whatever they need in CivPay, SASR is what we call it. If he needs additional resources to surge and get personnel in place to get those contract modifications in place, I, I'm going to provide it to him. We had those discussions today. We are committed to providing that. And he received that assurance that we're going to need to surge the instant the solution is determined. So we are fast-tracking all the variety of teams we need to make this happen in an expedited way so that you can see that there's, there's some demonstration of our commitment. It's not just words this time. And we need to rebuild that trust. And I continue to uh, encourage everyone to be vocal and give us your, your feedback, whatever it is, so that we hear it and we can respond to it. So. I just looked at my watch. We have a little less than 25 minutes left, so we want to get to your questions, please. Okay. Um, comment. After 15 years, the Air Force is sending in its A team. Congratulations. Okay, uh, second comment is, I think what I heard tonight is this water, which is some of the most valuable water that Albuquerque has with this low arsenic level, is never going to be potable water that the people of Albuquerque are going to drink? Is, is that what I heard? Because if that's what I heard, that's what I did, I did not know. And the, my second comment is, I've seen this map before. It shows that the plume is just passed over Louisiana. Is that the most current data you've got? Because that looks like it's an old map. I'm not sure of the date of that, Mike. Oh, I'm right at the top, the first quarter of 2014. Right. We sample and measure and chart and collect the data by the quarter and report it by the quarter. It's, it's always by the quarter. That's the latest data we have to report right now. <coughs> yes, sir. You had another question. That well, we need an answer about the potability of water. Okay, so portable water, when I meant that, what I meant was the water that we extract here is not going to be drink. Okay, that's what I'm referring to. Not the water that's being extracted from here and there right now. There are no detects of contamination. That water is safe right now. And I want to keep it that way. The only way I can keep it that way is for me to extract what's here, and pump it out, and treat it. And when I, after I treat it, what do I do with that water? Okay, now I don't think it's a good idea to put it into your drinking water supply or into Kirtland's drinking water supply. What I would suggest is that we reuse it in an industrial purpose. Does that help? Okay. 
I want to thank you for being as specific as you were in laying out the options related to treating the water. It's that kind of specific information that I think all of us are really asking for. I think I'd ask it in relationship to the financial commitment, which I understand through uh, statements made by our congressional delegation that uh, the Air Force has made commitments to support that. My concern is, and I want to know how it's going to be prevented, that Congress will get involved and take that away because it's an appropriated expense rather than a, a set expense for us. So I would like someone to speak to that. And then the other question, which I'm surprised no one has talked about, there is a report in the paper today, not that I believe everything the paper says, but there is a report in the paper today that there is a question by the NMED about the accuracy of some of the modeling and the contaminant level that's in the water um, that is underestimated what it actually is according to the consultants for the NMED. I would like someone to comment on your thoughts on that. First about the money. About the money. Now that's a tricky one, but I'm going to attempt to answer it. The Air Force receives a budget for the Environmental Restoration Program for its enterprise-wide all its era sites. We had about 8,000 sites, half are closed. Yay, good news for us as taxpayers, because that's a huge liability that was incurred for us about 20, 25 years ago for most of our sites. Okay, I'll slow down, I apologize. Okay, we have about 4,000 open active sites left, enterprise-wide, in the United States Air Force. That's about half of what we'd originally identified of 8,000. We've done some great things on closing sites. We have 4,000 to go. There is a large liability associated with that, and we are required by public law to report that liability annually. You can find that. That is reported. We do our reporting in accordance with standards that are provided to us. Army does. Navy does. We report our annual liability on a 30-year rolling basis. Okay. From a budget perspective, we then level what we're going to need each year to optimize and maximize achieving response complete and closure at our sites as quickly as possible to protect public health. We do this every year and we re-level based on information we have about the sites because we're constantly discovering new information about our sites that are still in an investigation and have to reallocate our resources appropriately to the highest risk sites. The highest risk sites are our public health risk sites. This is one of them. Therefore, any projects in our portfolio, the Air Force portfolio of open, active environmental restoration sites that have a public health risk automatically rise to the top. Nothing else is funded before those projects except for civilian pay, for payroll, families that depend on their payroll, right? That'd be like myself and Dr. Badur and the other staff that support the environmental restoration program. Second to civ pay, it's the projects that have a public health risk that are ranked and prioritized the top. That's how we were able to fund the Sentinel Wells midstream. We defunded the projects at the bottom of the list that did not rank as high because any emergent requirement that comes up that has a higher risk to public health immediately pops into the program appropriately in accordance with our risk profile and the other ones go down. Okay, so with the budgets we have, I can commit to you that the public health risk projects, namely these, will always be funded top. However, if my budget gets cut to $10, that's out of my control. It's only going to go so far, and it may not cover all the public health risk projects. We try to ensure that it does. We haven't dipped into that yet. But in FY16, with sequestration of budget cuts, we're trying to make strong arguments to our counterparts and Ms. Kathleen Ferguson that this is where, these is where the budget line cannot dip into to, for public health risk. And you can maybe cut these other ones that are research-type related projects, but this is where you're getting into the bone and you're impacting public health. And I've received assurances that even with sequestration, we will not have cuts so severe that it starts cutting into the line where we have public health risk. So, but we will see how that works out because some of that's, a lot of that's all out of my control. We just appropriately articulate to the decision makers where that line is, and so far they've made the right decisions. Did that answer the budget question? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, what was the second question? We may need help on that one from someone. Gas. With gas. <laughs> okay, so the gas bubbles, that's a great, great question. Yes, I actually um, knew about this because I talked to uh, Albuquerque Journal with Wayne. We both 
had a conversation or they asked us about it. At the time they asked us about it, I didn't know as much as I do now. I'm not gonna say I'm an expert yet on this subject, but I do understand the concerns of bubbles in the samples and how that affects the analytics and whether that shows a decrease in the amount of concentration that you report that makes these lines, okay? So if this is really one, is it really one, okay? That kind of discussion. So my understanding is, is that um, MMED and uh, CBNI have worked together on talking about sampling procedures, kind of going through what is how the how you collect that sample, how you could do it more effectively and efficiently to minimize this effect. Okay, so they've gone through that scenario together and have worked through that. So I think they have some conclusions on that. And I, the next time we meet, I promise I will make this an action item that we can have a little more in-depth conversation so that I can tell you what's happening. So as we go forward, we definitely know, I'm gonna be real honest with you, Every volatile organic contaminant that you take a sample for is tricky. It is not a straightforward thing, okay? It, because the contaminant wants to be in air more than it wants to be in water, it's always trying to get out, okay, of your sampling vial, okay? And you, we have a whole bunch of standard, standard operating procedures to try to minimize this as much as we can. And there still is some that escapes. There's just, it's an error in the process, and I trust me, if we could figure out how to not have it, we would solve it by now. But we have been working on this particular issue for a couple of decades, I would say, from a sampling technique perspective. What I would also say, though, is, is that right now, I mean, when we wanna get to the site to so, site closeout, this is where this becomes very important. You know, if we're trying to make the distinction that we are at that MCL or below that MCL, and if our detections are being skewed a little bit, that could be drastic, okay, in site closeout going forward. So one of the things that we've discussed with the technical team, with the Water Authority, and with NMED this week with my technical group is we need to talk about that and we need to come up with how we're gonna deal with that. Now, is that the crisis today? In our eyes, I would say no. Why? Because we are very interested in more getting this remediated now, getting something in here now, not waiting another 15 years. I think a lot of you would say yes to that. Um, that's what I'm invested in. So that is my response, it's not a complete one. I, I will acknowledge that, but I will promise you I will work on that and get you more information so we can have that open conversation. Sir, if, if I could ask just a question. I've noticed that Mr. McCoy has been waiting patiently and you've already asked a question. If, if Dave, if you're willing to wait for another question or would you like to, okay, That's thank you. This is just a, a comment. I was looking on the web to try to find something out about this. First of all, CAB, if you're not involved in this process, you don't really know what that means. And if you're just looking for something on it, you can't find anything on the Kirtland spill, basically, in an official way. I would like to suggest that you make a website that people can go to and get continuing, that's continually updated and get information on what's happening in this process. You know, the different steps that you plan to take and how you're filling those steps, how you're completing those steps and what the plans are and also have a Twitter account so people can communicate with you. You know, and somebody with some knowledge that might respond to it. Is this where Kirtland's new remediation? I don't know, you know, that's, see what I mean is these things are not advertised anywhere, are they? Yes, no. sir. Well, no, but that's why there aren't that many people here is because I don't, we, nobody even heard about the notice to this meeting. You know, I didn't hear about it except through the, the, the activist groups that are working on this. So we, we, we do publish a notice in the newspaper at least a week ahead of time. We send out notices to people who are good enough to leave their name on our mailing list. We send you an email notification. Is this a quarterly meeting? Yes, sir. And, and you, you publicize it a week before? 
week to a week and a half before we put the why notice not, in why, the paper. Why not three months before? Because we want you to be able to remember <laughs> when it is. We, we are reinventing that website as well. Hi, my name is Dave McCoy. I'm the Director for Citizen Action New Mexico. I've been following this process since 2008. And um, there's been a lot of turnover in personnel, uh, in the regulatory agency, in the Air Force, uh, in the Water Utility Authority, the governors, uh, people that uh, have looked at this problem, and um, each time I've heard uh, similar things that uh, we understand there were a lot of mistakes made in the past, and we're going to correct those things, we're going to move this forward. Um, maybe it'll happen this time. Uh, I've spoken with uh, uh, Adria and uh, some of the others, and it seems like uh, there's, there's a serious effort uh, which is intended to be made. Um, up against that is the uh, lack of experience, the ongoing experience and knowledge about this plume that stretches back years in terms of what has been done, what hasn't been done, the unknowns of the situation, uh, and the unknowns are staggering. I mean, we're talking about six, six million gallons. We're talking about 24 million gallons. That's perfect evidence uh, that the homework has not been done on this project. Now, one of the things that Citizen Action has uh, requested, and the New Mexico legislature uh, took up the matter, uh, is that there needs to be an independent task force to review this situation. Outside of the Air Force, experts from across the United States, perhaps even internationally would be uh, useful, uh, that have already looked at these types of spills and been involved with them. And we don't have that in the existing uh, makeup of uh, this particular spill. And that independent task force could review the situation. Uh, they could look at immediate emergency measures that could be taken to address this situation. Uh, the one thing that interested me most in meeting with uh, Adria Boudoir was that uh, she uh, readily recognized that there had been no site conceptual plan made for this uh, problem prior to all the different suggestions for activity have, that have gone on. Was that really three minutes? Yes, sir. Uh, um, anyhow, um, that site conceptual plan still is not in existence. Um, and frankly, this thing has been handled like a bunch of chickens running around with their heads cut off up until now. So I hope that we can get some real uh, coalescence on this matter uh, from from really some independent experts as well. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, my name is uh, Charlie Bennett. I'm with the La Mesa Community Improvement Association and here on behalf of the 6th District Coalition and Neighborhood Associations. I have one little question. Uh, there's, is there any aversion towards the use of uh, filtration with uh, activated charcoal filtration. Uh, I've not seen that referred to in any of the materials. Uh, and is it something that might be used in the near future? Yeah, um, if we do the pump and treat scenarios that we've been talking about, um, activated carbon treatment is one of the primary methods we'd use to remove 
uh, both the EDB and any, any other contaminants that are there. Thank you. Uh, let me, can you put on the uh, conceptual slight model slide? Is that one there? Uh, I'm John Hawley, uh, uh, Emeritus uh, Senior Environmental Geologist for the Office of State Geologist, and I headed up the uh, team that did the original hydrogeology framework model, and I've been involved just in the last couple of months leading as a leading task force on the hydrogeologic framework of the model. I was here when working for the state when the Ridgecrest 5 uh, currently in Air Force Base uh, 15, 16, and many of the wells drilled. Um, first, uh, one, uh, the, uh, I, I admit this is really schematic and people need to look down at the bottom. It says not to scale. That's sure, and there's, but I want the lay people in the audience to realize that uh, this brown area uh, it shows two important things, that most of the migration is in the uh, Vado zone or the unsaturated zone above the blue line, and that uh, my colleagues in the MED, like Dennis McQuillan, would certainly want to point out details on where the vapor plume is and everything. But I just wanted, there's two wells over there on the left. When you look at the, if your handout, it says Ridgecrest, five and Ridgecrest three, um, these are uh, city wells. They're the best wells we got. They pump 3,000 gallons a minute. Those wells are not screened. They shouldn't even off, they should be off scale. Those screens should be down. It, it implies that water is moving towards the intake screens of those wells. And, and those wells are sucking from uh, another aquifer, two aquifer layers down. Only the upper part of those screens have, uh, are there. So just remember that when you pick up this, everybody has his hand out, I think, just, uh, this is just a schematic. And uh, please don't, this, thank you very much. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you, and you're, you're absolutely correct. We need, we need to correct that schematic. Good morning, May Albuquerque. Um, I want to thank the new team for being here and for um, speaking with a clarity that we have not heard up till now. Thank you very much. Um, and um, real quickly, I know that the Water Authority is represented here. It, um, if someone from the mayor's office um, if there's anyone from Luan Grisham's office, Heinrich um, Udall's office, please stand up and, and let us know that you're here. Yes, ma'am, this will be the last comment. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. This might be a good segue. My name is Maggie Hart Stebbins, and I was elected to the Bernalillo County Commission to represent this area. I also serve as the Vice Chair of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. So the first thing I want to say is uh, welcome to the A-Team. I am really pleased. Um, I have heard statements tonight um, that we have been waiting a long time to hear um, over these last many years. Um, I look forward to the next six months um, and really seeing some um, work on the ground. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I also wanted to say I'm really delighted to be here tonight. Um, the CAB meetings always are the same night, same time as our Bernalillo County Commission meetings. So if you don't see me here on a regular basis, that's why. Um, that is my first obligation, but it is not in any way a reflection of a lack of interest in what you are doing here. So um, again, welcome, and I look forward, we all look forward to working with you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to remind you that our next CAB meeting is the 21st of October. I also want to invite you to take a look at the posters on your way out. A lot of hard work went into that. And if you like the way this was set up tonight, the way it ran, personally, I like the bigger room. Um, let me know if you have suggestions about the CAB meeting. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more. Hold on. Well, 
I like the bigger room, but we really need a room with better acoustics. Someone that's older like me, only I only heard maybe a third to half of what was said. So I would like to see these meetings held in an auditorium with good acoustics with room for everyone. Thanks. Okay, just really quick. I, I know I've had a lot of mic time, but I want to say one more thing. Um, and I want to clarify something. With the way we set up our budgets for proprietary setting up what is high priority based on risk, that risk is based on perception of risk, meaning in this case, we know that these wells have not yet been contaminated, but we know that there is a potential for that contamination. That's what puts it at the urgency. That's how that ranking goes. So I just wanted to make that clarification because I think it's an important one. I really do want to say also, thank you for listening to me. You know, I, I'm nervous up here. It may not seem like it, but I am. And I actually, you know, am excited to be here. I'm excited to work with MMED and the Water Authority. I like what I see on the ground. I didn't like what I heard coming in, but I'm liking what I see now, and I'm really excited about that. And I, I really say stay tuned. I think the next six months is gonna be an interesting, bumpy ride, but I do think you're gonna see some actions, and I think you're gonna understand what's happening more. So that's it, thanks. Give me your name and why you're here.